Hey everyone, welcome to our webinar series, uh, the very last of our three-part series on how we can error-proof our uh, assembly process. So uh, just some quick housekeeping uh, rules. Uh, the mics for everyone will be muted. Uh, however, that doesn't mean you can't participate in the conversation. Uh, feel free to use the chat function to ask uh, any question that you might have or provide a comment. We will be looking at uh, some of your questions a little bit later in the presentation, so feel free to use that chat function. Um, with uh, a hearty thanks, I wanted to, uh, to extend to, for you to take the time to uh, take a look at what we're having uh, to talk about our uh, error-proofing uh, webinar series. So uh, thanks again for um, being able to participate uh, with us, and I just wanted to say thanks uh, for doing that. Uh, a little bit of introduction if you haven't been uh, following along uh, with this series. Uh, my name is David Cash. I'm part of the marketing uh, the group here at Mounts. Um, I've been in the, uh, the torque industry now for nearly 20 years, and uh, I've been with Mounts for, uh, for 15 years. Um, I started out as a uh, territory sales manager, uh, and that gave me the opportunity to see uh, a wide variety of industries, uh, applications, um, and just a, an overall um, good representation of the torque world. Uh, I really enjoy uh, what I do, and I enjoy working for Mounts um, especially. And just to give you information on Mounts, uh, Mounts was founded in 1965 in this garage here. Uh, we quickly then moved to um, our current location in the heart of Silicon Valley in San Jose, uh, California. Um, Mounts was the first to uh, develop an electronic torque tester for the military. We also do have a distribution uh, service center um, in uh, the eastern part of the country in the uh, beautiful Gulf Coast there at Foley, Alabama. So that kind of gives you a little bit about uh, about mounts. Um, we do offer uh, services um, all over the globe as well. Uh, now to continue with our uh, series on um, error proofing and how we can help do that with the manufacturing process, um, a little bit of review from our first uh, two uh, webinars, but um, it all rests on the, uh, the Japanese philosophy of Pokayoke, which um, in its essence uh, means uh, to help to uh, mistake proof or help to prevent any type of inadvertent error that might uh, that might happen. Um, so that uh, that term uh, Pokayoke is widely used um, for that. You'll see that uh, term um, in uh, lean manufacturing, um, but in in its essence, it's trying to shape behavior. Uh, to constrain the operator or uh, whatever the process might be into preventing um, unforeseen or un, uh, unnecessary errors. So uh, there are a lot of uh, specifications, a lot of different uh, philosophies that, that make up the Pokayoke. I'm just going to highlight uh, three um, that pertain a little bit more to uh, our discussion here, and that is uh, facilitation, detection, and prevention. Uh, facilitation that is basically gives a either some type of written instruction or a sign instruction on what the application or what the process needs to be. Uh, detection um, this helps uh, when uh, doing a process if you can detect. That there has been an error so it can be uh, rectified and taken care of right then uh, and then prevention um, helps to make sure that you cannot uh, produce uh, an error um, at all and if we look at this um, simple animation Uh, where can we see this in everyday life? Um, we see it with uh, our outlets, uh, electrical outlets uh, here in North America that uh, if you're using a grounded plug, there's only one way that that can go into uh, an electrical outlet. 
Uh, we can also see it in the appliances that we use, uh, that the doors um, for a specific appliance, they need to be closed for the operation uh, and the, the appliance to run and work uh, to help protect uh, anyone that uh, may get damaged from it um, or uh, help prevent any type of uh, uh, necessary, unnecessary damage to uh, the, the surroundings. Uh, you can also see this um, in uh, riding a, a, lawn, uh, a lawn tractor. So there is a pressure sensitive switch that's located in the seat of the, uh, of the lawn tractor. If uh, a person gets up or uh, is, there's no uh, weight detected, then the system has a, an automatic kill switch that will go ahead and disable the engine and uh, obviously the blades um, that are cutting the grass to not cut anything that it's not supposed to. So uh, those are just some examples that where we see um, uh, poke yoke in, uh, in everyday life. So um, when it comes to manufacturing and the torque applications, what are, are some of the risks that, uh, that we can see and, and they may have you feel like you're walking on a, uh, on a tight wire there. Um, but through uh, a lot of the different um, uh, resources and, and uh, excuse me, the different um, recapping of the uh, different uh, challenges that we see um, as it relates to torque control. Uh, uh, over torquing um, is probably one of the largest uh, and biggest factors um, that may uh, affect uh, torque control. Um, you wouldn't think it, and most operators probably don't think it, uh, that uh, you know the German philosophy of Gutentight um, means that uh, it's not going to fail. But however, this can certainly put undue pressure on the uh, on the bolt uh, that may be fastened or the screw uh, and can uh, put it into uh, what's called an elastic state to where that that bolt then may have the opportunity to break or fail uh, prematurely um, if there is over torque uh, to that particular fastener so over torquing is is a big a big challenge um, in in manufacturing um, the next would be missing screws or under torquing. Um, perhaps an, an operator using an electric tool uh, simply lets go of the trigger before the tool clutches out. Then uh, that fastener is not properly seated um, and the head may be lifted and you're not really getting any type of clamping on that particular uh, joint or application. Cross threading um, is also a big uh, risk um, that may that may happen and basically a cross thread is where the fastener um, is not going into its uh its area uh, perpendicular or it's not catching the threads correctly and it uh evidently or it cross threads and the fastener will then immediately lock up now this is a real challenge because uh torque tools um basically will go ahead and will clutch out at the uh, proper torque. Um, however, that faster is not properly seated. So uh, cross threading, um, if not detected, can be can be a real issue as well. Um, and then we kind of touched on it a little bit, but the operators themselves, uh, they can be a real challenge for us. Um, if the operator thinks that uh, they think what uh, they do um, and how they do it is the best way other than uh, what they've been the, what they've been taught, and that could be um, in challenges uh, that require training, um, and that may not be something that uh, is readily available. Or, uh, but training is a is another challenge for us for manufacturing and in, in changing or challenging the operator. Uh, another manufacturing challenge could be the ability to uh, monitor your tool. Uh, are, is it being uh, checked uh, frequently? Um, are the calibration cycles uh, in uh, spec for that particular tool? Um, or does the tool itself uh, allow you to control uh, and collect data? Um, so those are, again, some manufacturing challenges. If we look at the overall process of the, uh, the, pro of the application, um, you may be looking at, at doing sequencing um, and trying to 
uh, have your operators go in a certain pattern when they do their assemblies. And there can be definite challenges with that. Um, first would be uh, any type of gasket application where if you uh, fully seat fasteners on one side, uh, then you are lifting the, uh, the portion of the gasket on the other side and you may not be getting it fully seated. So doing that in a sequence um, in multiple steps may help in producing a good uh, solid seal for that specific application. Um, another thing that comes along with gasket um, would be also any type of relaxation to a joint. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a gasket application, but uh, you could go ahead and torque your, uh, your fastener down and there could be some relaxation that happens immediately after that. So you're not seeing the, the torque that's desired for you. And in a sequence that can be, um, can be problematic as well. Uh, if we look at um, also, uh, for example, in the uh, gasket application, and uh, if one side is lifted higher than the other, that may change the coefficient of friction uh, for uh, the mating surfaces. So uh, in that specific example, coefficient of friction may be uh, an issue. Um, if you're dealing with uh, two different types of um, uh, metal or different types of substrate um, for a specific tool that's being used um, in the same application, um, that may create some challenges as well with friction. So again, those can, uh, those can help uh, in providing some challenges for us. The uh, next would be uh, the fasteners themselves. Uh, does the assembly that your operator is doing, do they have the opportunity to uh, use different fasteners in different locations? Um, you know, the, the real uh, issue may be that you have a fastener that has the same diameter, the same thread pitch, but they are different lengths. And if they're used in the wrong um, application uh, on an assembly, uh, that can pose a real problem with either, uh, again, lifted uh, fasteners that aren't completely seated, or you have fasteners that aren't fully engaged in, uh, in the assembly. So um, when we talk about error proofing um, and what we can do with that in the uh, assembly process, the more uh, layers that we can add to a specific assembly, uh, the better chances we have of helping to prevent any type of errors. Um, so this is uh, when we looked at our very um, first um, uh, seminar, uh, we were looking at how we could safeguard against uh, some of these sequencing um, and tightening failures. Uh, that may be seen and uh, we discussed our uh, the mounts MDC controller tool. Now uh, in error proofing uh, this particular tool gives us uh, some great advantages and again this is kind of just a recap uh, a little bit of the first um, webinar but we do have uh, the ability to monitor the application uh, and the tool um, from the very start of a trigger uh, to the very end of the torque event. So all of the information that, that happens between there, um, we can either monitor or we can track and we can use that information to help develop uh, additional layers of error proofing in uh, the specific rundown that may take place. Um, other advantages with this type of tool are uh, we do have the ability to have multiple different uh, presets. So uh, you have the advantages of being able to use uh, one tool um, that can replace uh, a number of tools that are on, on a bench uh, or work cell. Uh, we do have the ability to monitor uh, data that is uh, generated by the tool for torque events. So a time date stamp um, type of event, uh, we do have that, that type of ability. Um, we can interface with um, uh, I.O. devices, uh, PLC, uh, barcodes, other things like that that can help make the uh, application and the uh, torquing process um, go much, much easier. But as it relates to air proofing, let's take a look at one that we can certainly um, implement 
that is not uh, too terribly difficult. But if we look at this torque curve, uh, we've got two graphs here. One is our torque and the other is our angle. So the orange is the torque and the uh, gray line would be the angle. Uh, now, when I say angle, that means the amount of rotation that a fastener would go through. Um, and we can present uh, to the operation a window that's going to be a, a good uh, result for our fastening. So uh, the second graph we see here, it may be an example of a cross-threaded type of issue where uh, the tool, uh, once it's applied its torque, uh, we get our torque event. However, the amount of angle um, is not the amount that we need. So we have then produced uh, an error. So um, in the first curve, you can see that um, we did hit our torque value at uh, what would be um, our unit there. And we had about 500 degrees of rotation. Um, in the second graph, um, you see we only got 300 degrees of rotation, but we still hit the torque. So because we didn't satisfy both requirements, we were able to detect there was an error with that specific uh, fastening. And so that would help in the application process to detect um, a cross-thread issue. Now, this doesn't necessarily have to be uh, only for a cross-thread issue. Um, if you did have a stripped fastener as well, we would see um, neither of those events would hit the target um, and we would then produce uh, an error. It could also be used in um, if there is a washer setup or, or some type of gasket that may be um, implemented that is going to change the amount of angle uh, that we can see in that as well. So let's go ahead and um, we can jump into our quick demo to uh, show you how this works. And so I have um, our MD system here. Um, and I also have um, our thread block here. And if you can see, we have uh, a gasket material um, on this particular one, and we don't have one on this fastener. So how we set this up is we can set our tool to uh, have torque control with angle monitoring. So if I go into um, our setup menu and I want to uh, go ahead and program this in for our preset, um, I can simply go into our fastening tab and I can select our preset 12 that we're going to be using for this particular example. And you can see that our target torque we have here is set at six inch pounds. And on our next page is where we can go ahead and we can enter in our angle data. So with the fasteners um, that we have with our gasket, uh, we should see um, those seating uh, somewhere around 2200 degrees of angle rotation. So if we go back out to our process and um, we change our preset, to preset 12. Uh, you can see here we have our target at, at six inch pounds. If I go ahead and run this fastener down, um, we should uh, see that we don't produce uh, the error. So get over the fastener and we'll just run this down. Okay, so we've got our uh, angle in here at just over 2100 uh, degrees of angle. If we came over here to the setup that doesn't have the, the washer or the gasket material and we run this one down, you see we produced uh, an error because there was too much angle uh, or too much rotation um, that the fastener uh, produced so we did not have that gasket um, in that particular um, fastening. So this can help us um, detect uh, that way um, as well. Again, if we had a fastener uh, of different lengths, um, but they shared the same torque value, 
Uh, we could also do the same type of angle monitoring um, to help catch any type of fasting error that would be uh, associated with um, that specific um, uh, rundown. There are some other things that we can do to error-proof um, the, the possibility uh, during a rundown. Um, if we want to make sure that the fastener gets fully seated and the tool runs off, we can set in here um, in our parameter settings that the operator needs to hold down the trigger the entire uh, time for the assembly until the, the tool runs through its final operation. Um, if they do let go of the trigger before that, then they would receive an error and they would have to reattempt that one. And I can simply demonstrate that as well. So um, if I have the tool here, I just run it and then let go. You can see we produced uh, an error of a, no, a non-torque event. Um, so uh, there again, there are a number of things that we can do um, to help error proof uh, that specific assembly uh, on the MD. Now, when we look at um, our other types of uh, processes that we can use to help um, error proof, uh, last uh, webinar, we looked at our position control system. Uh, and this uh, really helps to elevate the uh, error uh, level uh, or error proofing level that we can, we can monitor. Um, this system helps to reduce or eliminate any type of, uh, of rework that may be needed. Um, it can detect and help to eliminate any type of screw fastening. Um, these types of systems uh, that we use uh, are associated with, uh, with torque arms that have uh, encoders. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. Um, but the addition of the torque arm uh, to the position control um, does a couple other things um, as well. And it's going to help to reduce or eliminate any type of uh, repetitive motion injury um, or any type of carpal tunnel that may uh, be associated with uh, some torque tools um, at, at a higher uh, torque that the operator may be absorbing in their wrists. Um, so this helps to give 100% transfer of the torque that's generated from the tool to the part and it's not uh, given uh, any uh, reaction to the operator whatsoever. Um, this is also very, very important at really low torque values as well. Um, when you're dealing in inch ounces and, and those types of uh, scenarios, any type of rework, or excuse me, any type of side load that may be introduced by the operator um, or any type of uh, uh, wrist movement um, could certainly help to introduce any type of uh, variations in the torque that would be generated by the tool if it was secure in a, a torque arm. So those are just some of the benefits of, of using the system um, with a torque arm. Um, but for uh, our system uh, and our, our uh, torque arm uh, that we use with our, our position system here, uh, we do have uh, two angle encoders on our articulating arm that help to monitor the tool where it is in space. Um, and this does a couple things for us. It allows us to make sure that we provide power to the tool only in the right um, position for a fastening. So if the tool is outside of the um, desired uh, sequence pattern, uh, then the operator can't uh, provide any type of um, power to any other part of the assembly other than what we deemed to be the, the proper use uh, and location for that specific fastener. So um, the torque values that we have uh, in this uh, configuration, um, we do can go up to 500, or excuse me, 100 Newton meters. Um, and then we can go up to uh, 500 Newton meters in uh, another different kind of configuration. Uh, we also have uh, telescoping arms that we could use as well. Uh, with different types of encoders that we can use to help monitor that um, in space as well. So how does it look if we um, use the, uh, the touch uh, or the arm uh, with our controller? Um, that would be the use of our, our uh, Posi Touch controller. Um, this is kind of the brains of the uh, positioning control system. Um, it allows us to be able to um, have multiple uh, different assembly jobs that we can have in the system. It helps to 
uh, initiate any type of work instruction for the operator uh, and guide them through the assembly process. Um, and we also have the ability to communicate um, with uh, DC tools, um, similar to uh, what I'll show you here in a second. And um, we also have the ability to communicate um, with other line device um, and devices within uh, the assembly process. So uh, you may need to communicate with a PLC or you may want to communicate with other manufacturing um, aids such as proximity sensors or uh, pneumatic lockers or actuators. Um, we can control all of that and work in conjunction with any type of communication uh, device on the touch. So uh, if we look at including um, both the positioning control um, and the um, MDC, then this gives us the ability to uh, look at being able to control uh, multiple things and again provide another layer of error proofing uh, solutions to the process. So um, if we take a look at uh, at this demonstration, um, let me just go ahead and make some adjustments here. And so with our uh, POSI uh, touch, let me just pull this in and move this. And adjust the focus here. Good. All right. And let me zoom back out so we can see both the controller and the tool at the same time. A little bit more, sorry. Okay, so with this example, um, we can see that the, the touch is giving us our work instructions um, and that we need to fasten um, a series. In this case, it's four fasteners. Um, and we're starting with position one, which is right here at this fastener. And then we can move through uh, the four different ones that we have. So right now, the tool is currently uh, in its locked position. Um, and so we don't have any power to the tool unless we get into the right location. So once we get over the right location, let me just add a little more light here. Um, we now have power to the tool. So in this case, um, we are using this um, for these four different fasteners. However, the last two fasteners have a different torque value. Um, and what does that look like uh, on the display? Well, I'll, I'll show you as we run through it. Um, so our first one um, is set to uh, four and a half inch pounds. And then we run this down. And since we've got a good uh, rundown um, here on our uh, display, if you can't, let me, one second. Okay, so we have um, our four fasteners here, and um, I had this system set uh, for a different input, so it didn't see that particular fastening. But um, if we move to our second location, and we run that down, um, we did uh, have our same uh, torque values, and then we move to our third location, and now it's changed here to preset two. And then finally, our last one, uh, preset three. So our job is now complete. So if we take a look at what we did in the programming of this particular 
uh, item. You can see that we had the ability to control the different uh, parameters and presets that we were using on the uh, MDC that were being controlled by the Posi Touch. So this is basically a, a build of what we just ran through. But if we take a look at our fastening step that we had uh, and our uh, program, um, you can see a number of different things. So let me go ahead and zoom in so you can get a better look at exactly what we're seeing. And let me just kill this out the way. Very good. All right, so uh, we do have um, our position data um, when the tool is being tracked. If we're in our position number one, um, you can see that this is the save data that we had. And we can only get a good uh, OK signal to run the tool if we're within uh, 35 uh, points or 35 units of this particular saved uh, location data number. And down here is where we can select which tightening job we would like our DC tool to go ahead and, and run. So that's how we can adjust the different programs and presets that we're using. And if we just jump to our last one, you can see that we moved to preset uh, three. Hopefully that comes out uh, clear there. But um, so this is how we can communicate uh, back and forth between the uh, MDC and also the uh, controller. Now, there are a number of other different functions and uh, we'll go ahead and we'll roll a, a video that shows how we can communicate with a, a number of different devices um, in, in the assembly area.
Okay, so um, that video uh, just shows you some of the components that are being controlled all by the DPC touch from the light tree to the sensors um, to the, the part management, all of that um, is being controlled uh, by the DPC touch. So you may say to yourself, well, um, I don't have a, a DC tool that I'm using. Is it possible to be able to use the, uh, the torque arm and position control system without that? Uh, you, you certainly can. Um, I will note that we can work uh, that system with any DC tool uh, that, uh, that's on the market. Uh, we can, um, again, also use it with uh, non-DC tools. So uh, if you have a mounts um, electric torque screwdriver that is a simple uh, clutch type of driver, we can do that as well. Um, so let me show you what that looks like. And so let me just make this change. So uh, now the, the touch itself um, is being uh, used with uh, our transformer style tool. And let me just zoom out here. And then you can see that uh, it's, we're being used with our SCC 40 and our BF120, um, which is now in the position uh, control arm. So if we load um, the specific job that we have here, um, we do have the ability to have um, up to uh, 255 different uh, applications uh, that we can use. But uh, if we look at this particular program um, that we used, and because the system uh, needs a way to validate that a fastening was a good rundown. Um, in this case, if we look at how we control that, it's basically done uh, through a time signature that is done for the specific fastener. So in our assembly here, we've got three fasteners that we're going to run down. Uh, for fastener one, um, our tightening time is just over uh, a second and a half. And so we can control that, that window tolerance um, to make that either as uh, tight or as loose that we would like. But this is another way that we can control uh, the torque value um, is being achieved within the right amount of revolutions on this particular um, application. So uh, if we look at the overall uh, job here, um, and we're creating basically uh, our necessary locations that we need to tighten. Um, so we simply can select from uh, a library of different uh, images that we have uh, to be able to create our program. Um, and that's how that is done. We can go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and run this from the beginning. And load that. So if we assume that I have an engine here at my desk and I move the tool to our number one fastening location, which is right here. Um, we now have power to the tool. Oh, but I ran the tool, excuse me, I ran the tool um, without it being on the fastener and you can see we generated a, a, a torque error. Um, so, as I get on the location, um, we have power to the tool. If I'm outside of that location, uh, we don't have power to the tool. And if we run this down, 
And we got a good rundown. And now we've created a uh, an engine. <laughs> Just kidding. So um, that's how we can use a uh, uh, an electric uh, clutch tool um, with the DPC touch um, to help us prevent error proofing. So you don't necessarily need a, a DC tool uh, to help give us that layer of protection on the uh, assembly. Um, so. As long as the tool that you're using does have the ability to send out uh, inputs or output signals um, to a, a specific uh, device, then we can harness that signal and we can convert it and use it to help error proof uh, your assembly. So some uh, uh, another solution that we have um, is the ability to use a bit socket tray. Now this uh, can be used either in conjunction with the MDC tool or with the DPC touch or with both of them. Um, and basically uh, this will allow um, the operator to make sure that they're using the correct bit uh, on an assembly part um, that, uh, that you may want them to use. Now um, you may say, well, what about if they just pick up one bit and then out of one location hole and then drop it into another? Well, we do have the ability to um, use color sensors as well. So if um, we put uh, colored um, either shrink tubing or paint on a fastener, or excuse me, on a bit, then we can control to make sure that it's the correct uh, bit that has been pulled from that particular uh, bit tray location. So that's just another layer that we can add to the, to the process uh, for that. So at this point, um, we'll ha go to uh, any type of uh, questions and answers. Um, Chris Morris, our marketing manager, is, uh, has the, the, the questions uh, available for us. So Chris, what kind of questions do we have? Uh, the first question is, how many fastening sequences can be stored with the MD system? How many fastening sequences? Uh, well, it, the sequence... Um, Let's see, we can break it down into a couple different um, numbers. So the, the system itself allows for uh, the ability to have 15 different presets uh, in a standard configuration. Um, and then within those presets, we can uh, do what's called a model. Um, and within that model, we can use those different presets in a determined number of fastenings. So say, for example, we had a, a fastening that is going to require three different torque values um, uh, at, with three different um, locations or um, uh, basically just three different passes, three different torque values. We can create uh, one model that can contain all of those, uh, all of that process. So we would have um, one preset go for three fasteners, then we have our second preset go for three fasteners, and then the third preset go for uh, three fasteners. And we can contain all of that in what's called a model. Um, now the system can run 15 different models. Uh, so the maximum that you could do in one model, if we had all fastening steps uh, throughout the 20 different steps we could do in a model, you can do up to 5,000 fastenings in one model. Hope that answered. <laughs> uh, next question. Are these, is the product available like in a robotic style where there's no operator hand being used? Uh, yes, the, um, the MD uh, does come uh, in a, uh, an automation style. Uh, that can be used in conjunction with a, with a robot. Um, so that can be a function. The position control system um, does, doesn't work with a, um, with a robot um, because that, they're kind of uh, uh, complementary, but um, that would work with a, a handheld um, type of application. Okay, thanks, Dave. On the bit tray, two parts. Can sockets be used with it? and how many uh, bits or sockets can be deployed? Uh, yes, sockets can be used um, with that. Uh, it just depends on the, um, 
on the diameter of the socket and how it fits in with the uh, the bit tray um, itself. But yeah, it's normally called a bit socket tray, so you can use it in conjunction either way. Um, there are two styles that are available. You have either a four position um, tray or an eight position tray. Okay, thanks, Dave. All right, next question. Can a screw presenter or screw feeding system be used instead of having the operator pull fasteners out of a bin? Uh, it certainly can. Um, we can use uh, uh, different uh, screw presenters within um, the ability for like the POSI, uh, the POSI touch system to work. Um, we can go ahead and designate a certain zone that the screw presenter is in to allow uh, power to be given to the tool. So it can be used um, in conjunction uh, with a screw presenter for sure. Okay. And then the last question is, how many barcodes can be pre-programmed and saved for either device? Um, so uh, the, uh, the touch device um, will allow you to have um, as many programs uh, that you have available to uh, go ahead and pull. So um, the standard, I believe, is 255. Uh, right now, it may have been expanded, but 255 uh, different uh, barcodes could be read with the uh, DPC Touch. Um, with the, uh, the uh, MD system, um, you'd be looking at 30 different uh, barcodes that you could use uh, in conjunction with different presets and models. All right, and that's all the questions. All right, uh, great. Appreciate that, uh, all the questions. Um, in addition to the error proofing uh, part of our um, a webinar series, we also included some information on um, the COVID-19 um, uh, requirements that may have uh, followed or may be um, implemented in your uh, specific type of um, environment and manufacturing process. And so we've sent out a, a number of surveys um, from the beginning of this webinar series uh, until now. And this is kind of just a, a compilation of those uh, results that have, uh, that have been come in. Um, and so I'll just go over a, a few questions and then uh, basically the, uh, the answers that we had for those um, and the results uh, for the specific questions. So our first one was um, which of the following <clears throat> poses the top three challenges for, uh, for your business and, and organization? Um, as it relates to continuity. And the uh, number one answer was um, being uh, reduced uh, order sales. Uh, second would be delay in delivery from suppliers. Um, and then we had a tie for third, which is going to be uh, the availability of uh, the workforce and also uh, any type of uh, shutdown from suppliers uh, that would be classified as non-essential businesses. So. Our second question uh, was, uh, what are, the, are your top three manufacturing concerns with respect uh, to any type of COVID-19 requirement? Um, and uh, the number one would be uh, supply chain uh, disruptions, um, the ability for you to get uh, the parts that you need to manufacture uh, what it is you are manufacturing. Uh, second was employee health and safety. Uh, and again, uh, we had a tie for third, which would be uh, the effects on the workforce, uh, reduced productivity, and also the any type of manufacturing facility closures. The uh, last question that we'll look at here is uh, what process or tooling changes um, are you considering um, implementing during uh, the uh, COVID-19 um, manufacturing and our top uh, three answers that, uh, that we saw here um, was the being able to add tooling for uh, increased distance between work, uh, work stations and, uh, and workers. So um, a big advantage of uh, the MD tool, uh, the MDC, is that we have the ability to replace uh, multiple tools with just one tool to have different uh, presets that are available that we can use um, to help um, in that to be able to reduce uh, workers, uh, workstations. So um, the next answer there was uh, visitors 
um, and not being able to uh, accept visitors in uh, on the factory floors. Uh, and then our last two there, uh, implementing any type of automation tool solution and implementing error proofing uh, solutions as well. So those are kind of the results of the survey uh, from some of the other uh, participants that, that they saw. And um, so with that, that's going to basically uh, conclude our webinar series here. Um, we do have uh, some poll questions that are gonna be submitted uh, or that you could take advantage of right now. Um, so there's a series of, of questions as it relates to uh, the presentation that we did and the job uh, that we did. And if you'd like um, Mount's uh, representative to contact you. So um, if you wanna go ahead and uh, initiate that poll, Awesome. So we'll let that uh, that continue to uh, to go um, as long as uh, may need be. But I just want to say uh, thank you again to everyone who uh, was able to log on and participate today. Uh, and uh, stay tuned. We are going to have uh, more webinars coming um, in July and also again in August. Um, so uh, be out the lookout for that. And with that, I will say thank you very much and have a great day.